Welcome everyone to the Adversity to Advantage podcast. On this fine morning, we've got Emmy Estacio with us, uh, originally from the Philippines, but lives in the UK and is a psychologist, so a trained psychologist uh, and has transitioned into a world of coaching and probably personal transformation as well. And so we connected recently and there's some stories here all about adversity, but are just about your journey. So I'm excited. Welcome to, to the show. Thanks for having me, Petra. I'm really excited too. It's so good to have you. Um, so just give us a little bit of context to your background, I guess. Growing up, what was that like? Do you think your your parents and, and maybe the education system sort of set you up for life in the real world? Oh, to be perfectly honest, I was a bit of a nerd <laughs> when I was a child. I, I always, always excelled in school. Um, I'm always the teacher's pet, if you like. And and everything that I did, I, I focused a lot on on being the best in school and actually even after I I graduated um, you know to go into my career as a psychologist I I pursued my master's that's why I came here to the UK I came here to do my master's did my PhD did my postdoc became a lecturer so I was always striving for excellence because that's how I was brought up I didn't get a lot of pressure from my parents though I think it was just me you know putting a lot of pressure on myself to do well until the time when I had my child, you know, gave birth and suddenly things became different because it's not just me anymore. You know, I had this other human being that I had to take care of and that was completely different for me. And I did struggle a bit. I wasn't, suddenly I wasn't excelling, if you like, as as a mom. Like, how can you excel as a mom? I didn't have experience as a mom before. And things became different at work as well because um, suddenly I, I'm putting in a lot of time and, and effort and, and, and my energy to, to, to take care of my child. And so, you know, work became completely different. And that's when I started to struggle. And, you know, postnatal depression also also started to kick in, which was something completely new to me. So yeah, that's um, that's when things started to become different. It was so unfamiliar to me because I always was the best, if you like. And then suddenly things were starting to, to become different when, when things changed in, in that respect. And so I really want to dive in deep to the postnatal depression thing because that's my experience as well and it's really useful for for other mothers or even for fathers to understand the psychological process that can happen for us but i am curious about this this sort of childhood and and you said your parents didn't put pressure on you uh did, did you have siblings like what was was it an internal drive what do you think that was that helped you or made you think you needed to push to be the best the whole time I don't know, probably because I was the youngest and I always wanted to be just like at the same level as my brother and my sister. And maybe I also identified myself as as the geeky one. It's just just how I, I saw myself and, and that's how I pursued it in terms of, you know, academic excellence and, you know, doing well at school and then eventually doing well in my career as well. At the expense of relationships and you know friendships social life that kind of thing um up until i was 26 you know before i met my husband i never really had a a deep relationship well i never really had a, a romantic relationship before that because i was just absolutely immersed in my in my work and in my career and my mom always um asked me it's like you have such an, an imbalance in your life it's like are you all right? You know, they, they were worried that I was going to be alone. And I said, it's just not an interest for me. I, I, I love my work. I love um, studying. I love academia. And, and that's, that's what I pursued. And that's actually one of the reasons why I also struggled after I gave birth. Because suddenly academia wasn't the same as when I started with it. You know, suddenly it's not a priority anymore. It's it's it used to be the only thing in my life, and then things changed when you when you actually give birth. So that, so that's interesting. So so you're talking about your deep connection at the at the risk of losing or or not cultivating anything else in your life. So you obviously had this 
love of learning. Interesting that you said uh, about the role, like that you were seen as the geeky one or the smart one or, you know, and um, it's interesting how different siblings will have a different role really early on, right? Sort of a, a title that they need to, even though they're changing as people as they grow older, it's still like they're, they're just attached to, to that. Do, do you remember what labels any of your other siblings sort of were stuck with? Well, well, I was the nerd. Um, my sister was actually the pretty one. Um, she she attracted all the attention um, in that way. But yeah, she's gorgeous. Yeah, I still I still identify it as that. You know, she's absolutely gorgeous. And my my brother is the funny one. He's just a, an absolute joker. And and I ended up taking on the the role as the as the nerd. That's that's so interesting. Just for people to listen and attach like meaning to, to what's the role that they were given and then they began to live into and then and then you get to a point and maybe for you you had the disruption of a child that forced you to maybe think about it and go is this the path is this the the sort of label that it's not the it's not the only label anymore you're now a mother you're now a wife or a girlfriend you, you've got these other contexts and you had to sort of reevaluate. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's exactly that. And for me, that, that sort of triggered the crisis because if, if, you know, because I've identified myself, uh, you know, as an academic, as this, as this um, someone who achieves it in, in her career, and then suddenly I'm a mom, which is actually, actually really fantastic. But I have never been in that position before. Um, I've always just always just focus on myself and my career and actually I, I work as a community psychologist um, so you know I did engage with a lot of um, community organizations stuff like that but being responsible for another soul that's a big deal. <laughs> what do you think your expectations were of parenting before you had your son? Expect I knew that it was going to be hard, and to to be perfectly honest, I never really had a, an, any ambition. I didn't really dream about becoming a mom. I was thinking, okay, if it happens, yeah, sure, but it, it's not something that I I was obsessed with. Um, it was actually my husband who wanted to have a family, and so I thought, yeah, sure, let's let's give it a go and and see how it goes. And and I do remember. Um, maybe about four or five months before I gave birth, I was actually telling my boss, um, look, can I, can I still come into work even when I'm on maternity leave? You know, I, I don't want to lose momentum and, you know, I just want to keep going. It's okay, I'll leave my child um, at home and, you know, so I can get on with, with work. And I never really anticipated that that's not going to be the case. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't anticipate that I will feel differently and how my priorities will shift once this person comes into the world, it's it just took me by surprise, and it's something that was completely um, unexpected from me. A shock. So, yeah. so talk us through that time. So, you're, you're like, what was the pregnancy like? At what point did you begin to think or realize that something was different? Oh, right. Well, actually, in terms of the pregnancy, um, the pregnancy was quite difficult to be honest like I was I would I had morning sickness for 12 weeks <laughs> so I was really quite sick the whole time the carrying the child you know ca having my my son inside me it, it was quite a, a an unusual well I've never been pregnant before so it, it's it's a really completely different experience for me I wasn't really scared of giving birth um, I was actually more scared of what was going to happen next. Mm. Um, I thought that childbirth was just, yeah, okay, you'll go to the hospital, you know, give birth, that's, that's it. But it's actually what happens next um, that was difficult. And, and the truth is because me and my husband, we are both migrants here in the UK. It's just me and him. We don't have um, family here. We don't have relatives here who can offer us that support. We, we, we don't have time off. Um, you know, so it's just me and him juggling um, childcare work. He's also doing his PhD. So that's when things started to to change because in terms of control over our time, you know, in terms of control over our um, priorities, if you like, that's when suddenly we had a shift. And for some reason, I don't know if this is just me being a little bit weird, but Something also changed at work. 
like the way I was being treated at work also changed um, because I have a son. I was being given less responsibilities, which actually would undermine um, how I want my career to progress. So I was having difficulty um, with that. I, I couldn't really process that really well. It's like, don't they trust me that I can that I can handle this? Don't they trust just because I gave birth? Does that mean that I I lost the skills and experience that I used to have before I gave birth? So I had a a bit of a crisis there as well, and I couldn't really comprehend why I was being treated differently just because I had a child. So so that's disconcerting in itself because you've always been respected your work has shown its value uh you've worked your way up to a certain extent within your education and academic career and i imagine that that there were subtle differences at first you almost don't want to believe that it's different you kind of go Mm. and they actually i when when responsibilities were being taken away from me i was thinking I wonder if they're right. You know, you start questioning yourself. And that's actually when the imposter syndrome started to kick in. Because I'm thinking, you know, maybe I was just fooling everyone. You know, maybe I'm actually not good at what I do. Maybe that's why they're taking this away from me. But it's not that. There are just some subtle hints of, I don't want to say discrimination, but it probably is. (laughs) Um, um, That, you know, just because I gave birth, you know, it doesn't mean that I lost my skills. It doesn't mean that I've lost my experience. I'm still this competent person that I used to before I gave birth. But why are all these opportunities and, and, and responsibilities being taken away from me? So... Yeah, I, I I had a bit of a, a crisis there. I couldn't comprehend why. And I started questioning myself as well. You know, maybe they are right. I'm not sure. You know, maybe I was just fooling everyone before, but now I couldn't fool them anymore. So, you know, so that's that's where um it sort of spiraled. I think that's what triggered actually the the postnatal depression as well. Because for the first couple of months, actually, I, I was really joyful. You know, it was it was fantastic. But it was that return to work and, you know, just having all these um, uh, stresses as well, you know, with the time management and uh, the irresponsibilities being taken away. It's just, um, it just went downhill from there. And then, like, not to mention that just the psychological and physio- physiological experience of creating a child and then looking after it and... Um, and and you you don't know exactly what you're doing there. Like there's a bit of fear about you know do I know how to take care of this baby? So you're going to have some natural self doubt on that side. And then if work, which used to be your safe place, right, where people wouldn't really question you, you collaborate and stuff, are now quite, it feels like you're being questioned. It's like this whole sort of pot of uncertainty, right? Absolutely. So it it actually felt quite chaotic. Like nothing nothing is going right. Um, I used to have um, full control over what I do at work, um, and suddenly that's evaporated as well. I used to have full control over what's going on at home, and that's you know evaporating up in the air as well. Um, you know because our routine, uh, you know your sleep, <laughs> you can't really you don't really have control over your sleep when you have a newborn child. Um, not that he was difficult. He, he actually slept through the night, I have to say. <laughs> you know, to be fair with my son, he's, he's a really good sleeper. But, you know, you, you get exhausted. Um, uh, you know, it's it's a physical thing. Um, so physically, psychologically, emotionally, it, it was it was quite a, a difficult um, time in my life. And for me, I was thinking it's meant to be joyful. You know, people are expecting you to be happy because you have a child, but here I am having all these doubts, having all this anxiety. It was actually the first time when I started having um, really bad negative thoughts in my head. Um, I was getting panic attacks that I've never experienced before. Um, I thought I was having a stroke at some point um, because I've never experienced panic attacks before. I couldn't feel my hands. I could, you know, my I had like these crab finger, like what cra- yeah. crab claws, yeah. <laughs> something like that. Like my 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 hands were locked. It's like what's what's going on? I've never had this before. So that was my first um, panic attack, and and it was quite. Um, 
unsettling, you know, because yeah. I've never experienced it before. I know about it in psychology, but to actually experience it myself, exactly. ooh, no, exactly. never happened to me before. And also, just from this like resilience point of view, it sounds like you were smart, you just were on a trajectory, you were good at things, maybe there were a few disappointments, but it sounds like you hadn't maybe experienced much failure or many exploring many things that you weren't good at because you stayed in your safe sort of lane. Whereas you weren't testing out your resilience in relationships or in like other areas where you might fail and need to bounce back. And so it sounds like everything culminated in this one big feeling of failure or not being able to control your home situation, your work situation, and then your body because you're having panic attacks and anxiety and, and, and all the rest of it. And yeah, and my, my, my body was reacting in, in so many different ways. So I started getting IBS. I, I had panic attacks. I had headaches all the time. I even had vertigo at some point. Um, and have you ever experienced vertigo? Do you know what that's like? Um, I, I opened my eyes. I turned my head just a little bit. And suddenly, it's like this violent um, swirling. Like the world was just swirling violently for like 15 to, to 20 seconds. And then it stops. And then I turn my head slightly again. And then again, the violent swirling was, it was just unbelievable. And I had that for about um, two days. So I was bedridden for two days. I was vomiting because it was just, you you turn your head and everything just, everything just swirls. You know, it like the world is moving, but it's not, you know. So my body was um, reacting in these really, um, extreme ways that I've never experienced before. And that was actually my wake up call that says, look, you have to stop this. This is, this is not right. And academia has always been my comfort zone. It's, it's my safety blanket. Yeah. And for me to, to jump out of it, realizing that it's actually what's causing me all this um, turmoil, all this stress, it's time to let it go in and move on to the next chapter and embrace this, this role, my role as a mom, and also my role to to reach out to more people, um, especially like for for mothers who may be experiencing this, or for some people who might be scared of taking on a new role. For me, I've embraced my 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 role as a nerd and as an academic, and to step out of that took a lot of courage. But I have to say that was the best thing I've ever done. Because I got better, um, family life um, became blissful once again, um, and and things are starting to to get back in in order. So it took a lot of courage. It's scary, but I had to do it and step out of my comfort zone. And so I know that now you're you're doing coaching. You you're an author. You've got books out. There, there's a whole range of things that you're being you're really successful at. So it sounds like a really um, easy story in the sense of like academic, ooh, a bit of a blip, ooh, and then we get over here, right? And I, I know because I've been through it myself that it's never that way, right? Never so- that way. It, it wasn't an easy journey. Um, basically, it, it took about two and a half years before I I realized that something needs to change. And, and at some point, you know, I, I needed serious help and I didn't actually ask for help because I always wanted to show that I'm I'm good at what I do. I, I don't need anybody's help. And, you know, it it's that wake up call, you know, having these vertigo attacks, having these panic attacks that I've never experienced before. That's that's actually the wake up call that um that made me take this leap. And if I didn't take that leap, I don't think our family will, sur- will survive. I don't think I will survive. I don't think I'll be here um, if I didn't take that leap. And so would you, you, you talk about the panic attacks and things like that. Can you um, think of a, a, maybe a rock bottom moment or some? Do, did you have a defining moment that made you go, I'm desperate, I ha- something has to change? Or was it more of a gradual kind of knowing? I have to say it it was gradual, um, but it was when I actually thought I was having a stroke <laughs> that actually triggered me. Um, it was a panic attack, but, you know, I thought I was having a, a stroke and that when it triggered me, like if if I die or if something happens to me, 
I'll get replaced just like that. Um, you know, at work, they I'm I'm replaceable. They they can just get someone new easily. But if something happens to me, something bad happens to me, my son will never have another mother. I will always be his mother. And, you know, I, I need to be there for him. I, I, you, you cannot replace that, that bond between a, a mother and a child. And that's when I told myself, look, I have to look after myself. Something has to change, even if it's not for my sake, but at least for the sake of my child and my family. So actually, that's what prompted me, you know, that panic. It was quite severe. We had, that was the first time we had to call 999 because wow. I, I honestly thought that I was... Um, I thought I was having a stroke. That was my prompt. I wouldn't say that was rock bottom um, because it was, you know, I stayed there for a while and, you know, it, 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 was, it was at that position. But um, that prompted me to actually, you know, something has to change because if something happens to me, my son will, will suffer. And then I imagine the process of knowing that, you know, you said you've got to be there for your son and letting go of the academia probably before you knew what you might replace it with, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's where the courage is, right? Because you got to let go and, and you don't quite see the way ahead. What was that like? Absolutely terrifying. <laughs> it was absolutely terrifying, you know, because... Okay, I might. I have an idea that okay, I will write my books and and see where that will take. Because that that's a still comfort zone. You know, I'm an academic. I can write books. I can publish it. And actually, my my first couple of books um, have been quite successful. You know, change your life for good, imposter syndrome remedy, fear is not my enemy. You know, these are the books that I write. And you know, it's psychology. It's easy for me, but. I couldn't live off just from royalties, from books. So, you know, what else can I do? And, and that's actually quite a, a scary prospect. But um, when I took the leap, I, I had people uh, in my group, you know, I have my own Facebook group. They were quite supportive and they they have this faith that I'm, I'm going to make it. And, and they are there um, to support me. And, and they would say, you know, you, you, you will do so much more amazing things rather than just confining yourself in the four walls of the university. You can reach more people by stepping out, writing books for lay audiences, um, coaching them and helping them in their, in, the, in their lives, making the transition themselves. And, and yeah, I find that absolutely gratifying. What I, whatever it is that I'm doing now, you know, I'm doing coaching, I'm coaching other authors to write books as well. It's, it's really satisfying. I never would have thought that I would be doing something like this, but now that I'm doing it, it's fab. So what are the, the main lessons that you've learned along the way? Because I'm hearing a few, like, like what are you like now in asking for help, for example? Mm. Is that you look after your, your well-being? Are you still faced with imposter syndrome? Like, what, what shows up for you now and what have you learned? Well, the truth is, um, I, I would say imposter syndrome is something that we couldn't cure. Um, that's why my book is called Imposter Syndrome Remedy, because it's something that you can only remedy. You cannot really um, cure it, because every time something new comes up, there will always be that self-doubt that, mm, you know, am I good enough to do this? Uh, you know, will I, will I be able to handle this? When you, when you step out of your comfort zone and you do something new, imposter syndrome and self-doubt will always kick in. But from what I've learned from my experience, it's it's all about being open to new experiences and learning that your personality, your your characteristics, your your identity, it's not fixed. You know, I identified myself as a nerd and as an academic, but that's not always um, going to be the case. You know, now that I'm a mother, I'm taking on new roles, I'm taking on new responsibilities. And it's all about embracing these new identities that, that come our way as, as, as our life um, unfolds. So what I've learned is yeah, adopting a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset is really important. 
And if you have self-doubt, if you have all these inner critic messages in your head, don't worry, it happens. You know, be open to actually have a dialogue with your inner critic. You know, think about where these um, inner critic messages are coming from and move on from there. You know, you, and you don't have to um, tackle it on your own. Um, my business is actually called the PAMI Code, which is a Greek word that means let's go together. And it's it's just a reminder that in this life, um, we can go together. You don't have to go through this journey on your own. Um, it's more enjoyable. It's more fulfilling when you get to share your wins, your challenges, you know, your struggles with other people. And we are all in this together. So, yeah, so that's those are the key things that, that I've learned from my experience. You know, adopt a growth mindset. It's not everything is fixed. Learn how to have a, a dialogue with your inner critics and, and tackle it, um, you know, one step at a time and try to share your, your journey with others and, and ask for help and, you know, if, if you need it. Do you still struggle with that one? The, the, with, I, with, with the asking for help, just because you're, you're that super self-reliant, smart, you know, can handle things. And I imagine there's like a, a quite a lifetime of conditioning around, you know, your expectations of yourself and um, mm-hmm. I can figure this out, use my brain or whatever. Um, but obviously you had that crash point. So I'm always curious about how hard is it or how do you challenge yourself to, to ask for help when you need it? Yeah, it, it does take a bit of getting used to <laughs> because with that, you know, I, my husband says that I'm a bit of a control freak. <laughs> I like everything um, done in a certain way and I want to get things done myself. Um, and if I can do it, I'll do it myself. But it's it's been that people see when I struggle and they actually notice when I struggle and they do offer help. So with that, I can see the prompts. <laughs> I'm learning to see when I need to ask for help before before people actually offer it. So it's it's still it's still a learning experience. Um, but I'm starting to reach out now to people who who actually have more experience than me. Who actually it's yeah again you know it's recognizing that you don't know everything, um, and that there are people who who have more experience who actually can do things better than you and, and asking for support in that way which takes humility and um understand and le- le- letting go of some of the control um, i'm curious about your book about fear is not the enemy is that is that what it's called um and just that that idea of when we feel afraid of something what are your top tips for our listeners about like what do we do when we're afraid run away show up like what's your thought take on it Yes, well, actually, in, in psychology, we, we, we talk about the fight or flight response. Um, whenever you, you experience fear, you know, it, it triggers an automatic um, reaction. It's, it's part of our evolution to, to respond to fear. Either you tackle it, you see it as a challenge, you fight it, or you, you flee, you, you, yeah. you run away from it. Um, but for some people, especially when, when the fear is so ingrained, they actually feel embarrassed uh, about the fear and they try to hide that they are feeling the fear. And, and in that way, the fear is still there. You're not actually doing anything about it. You, you know, there's, there's this new response. It's fight, flight, freeze. You know, some people freeze now or they flop. Like, uh, I can't do anything about it. I'll just yeah, yeah. And, and do whatever it does to me. So there's these um, new responses now. But what I would say, if you actually feel fear, I say fear is not my enemy because it is part of our survival. Fear actually, incur- uh, fear is a trigger that tells you that you are um, concerned about something, that there is a potential risk, that you care about something so much that you are scared that you might lose it. Whether it is you are scared to lose your autonomy or whether you are scared that you lose you will lose your identity or your relationships or you might lose money, you know, something more tangible. Fear is there because there is a potential risk. But instead of running away from it, what you need to do is to recognize that fear is your friend. It is telling you, look, there is a risk. Take some precautions, you know, see what's going on. And based on your assessment of your abilities, based on the assessment of the circumstance and the consequences of action or inaction, then you can make a decision, a conscious decision on what to do next. So what I would say, if you feel fear, befriend your fear, talk to your fear and and make the assessment of, of what you can do, of what what the circumstance is, 
and what would be the consequences of taking action or not taking action, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. So to put, put a conscious thought process, almost like to give you a buffer from that immediate reaction or that fight or flight response. Absolutely. Because the fight or flight response is, a, is an automatic response. It's a primitive response. Whereas with um, what I just told you about assessing, assessing your abilities, assessing the circumstance, assessing the risks, and also assessing the potential consequences of action or inaction, that's more um, an advanced part of your brain. It's more of a cognitive um, processing of, of what's going on. So exercise that. Don't don't just hide away from the fear or suppress your fear. Take your fear as your friend. Have a conversation with the fear so you can make a more conscious um, decision on what you need to do about it. Amazing. So obviously, if people want to know more, they can uh, uh, check out your, your books. I'm curious because your entire life has changed from those sort of rock bottom uh, moments within those two and a half years or, or you know, your entire career, your entire mission, your entire focus has changed. Now, do you, it's always a weird question, do you have any regrets around that experience? You know, like, do you wish that it, that it hadn't happened or has it built your character in some way? Yeah, I always keep telling my husband this because we, it, it was, uh, it was really difficult. Um, it was a really difficult experience, but I, I felt that it was absolutely necessary because if those things didn't happen, I would have just stayed in academia and, and retired in academia and not do what I'm doing now. And, and to tell you the truth, my books and my coaching, it's a lot richer and more meaningful because I've went through that experience. Without it, I'm just going to be a textbook you know, kind of coach, if you like. Even if I pursue coaching, it's all theoretical. It's all... You know, I've, I've read this research, I've read this book, you know, so that's why I'm telling you this. But now I, I can draw something from my own experience. I can relate, I can empathize more um, because I've been through it myself. I know that transitioning um, from one career to another or making these bold, courageous moves in our life is, is not easy because I've been through it myself. So... You know, I, I wouldn't change anything. I have no regrets. It was a really painful, you know, traumatizing experience, I have to say, but they were absolutely necessary. Otherwise, my, my life would be completely different. Um, you know, I, nothing, I, I would have just moved on with that trajectory of, you know, academia all my life and, and not really making much of an impact as I am having an impact now. Amazing. Um and, and I want to highlight that having experienced postnatal depression, like we're, we're talking about some of the, the touch points of it, but there are the moments of such loneliness, isolation, darkness, negative thinking towards your child, negative thinking about yourself. Like I, I almost ran away several times. I mean, I had alcohol addiction in my story as well, but like the internal turmoil is so heavy and intense. You, you don't deserve, you don't feel like you deserve to be a mother. You, you literally question everything. And, and I want to highlight just how, dark, like, I really hear you in saying, when, when you're saying it's difficult, I'm like, ooh, it's difficult. Like, <laughs> it can just change. I mean, do, does that make sense for you? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, I, I never really anticipated for uh, that to happen to me. And actually, to tell you the truth, when I was at that point, I didn't even recognize what it was. I just felt like I was it was dark it was lonely but i never really identified it as postnatal depression because me no i don't get it i'm always this happy cheerful how how is that possible but actually when people started to notice and when i started saying all these unhelpful words coming out of my mouth people started to get scared for for my life and that's when i there was one point i actually had a colleague we were having a conversation she locked me in her office um until i actually picked up the phone and called the doctor for help what were you that, saying to her that made her so worried um that i wanted to end it all <laughs> Yeah. So she said, uh, this is not quite right. She locked me in her room and didn't let me out until I booked an appointment to see a doctor. I so I, I have to, to, I'm really grateful for that colleague of mine. We're really good friends. You know, we, we see each other almost every week. She comes over to, to, to visit us, um, to check on us. But um, yeah, she didn't let me out of her office until that, that appointment was made. 
that that's an amazing friend and amazing. I mean, you were desperate enough to get to the point where you were actually saying these things, but that gives us a glimpse into how dark how it how dark it turned out. Yeah. So dark. Um, and so now, as a parent, I think you said your son is four. Yes. And so this idea of building resilience in our kids. Now, you know, you had this sort of perfect trajectory of of pushing forward. What do you want to teach him, or what do you think is important for him to learn now and, and as he he develops to to maybe pr- maybe prevent some of the stuff that's happened to you, or or just give him a better chance at coping? I don't know. Is there any thoughts there? Yeah. Now now that I've you know now that I'm a parent myself and I've been through this and looking at my child and so on, it's it's not about perfection. Um, it's okay to make mistakes. Um, if you do something, it's not perfect. It's okay. What do you learn from it? How can you make it better next time? What skills are you gaining? What 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 um, characteristics are you gaining as a result of failing? And actually, they're not really failing. It's it's a learning. It's pre-success. Let's put it that way. You know, you're learning as you go. So it's 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 recognizing that yeah, not everything has to be perfect. If if you have difficulties. Um, see what you can do. If you can't do it yourself, you, you know you can reach out and ask for help. But it's it's all about learning and growing and developing um, as you go along. So that that's what I would that's what I would say. It's it's in 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 psychological terms, you call it having a growth mindset rather than just having a fixed mindset. And you know, being perfect. It's it's not the end all, you know. Being the best, it's it's not it's not the you know the the thing to aim for. It's it's all about growing and learning and developing as you go. And then with that mindset, pretty much everything can be an opportunity for growth. It also means with this fear element, pushing towards the thing that's important to you or that you want to test. You you can't fail. It's all going to be yeah. Amazing. It's okay. You'll you'll learn from it. Yeah. And actually, that's one of the things you know that I've written in my book, Imposter Syndrome Remedy. You know, people who experience imposter syndrome have this fear about taking on new, um, taking on risks. You know, taking on new responsibilities um, because they are scared to fail. Um, you know, the, moving out of their comfort zone. They they don't want that because yeah, it will expose them as a fraud if they fail. You know, this is what they are thinking. But actually, you know. It's not that you are failing; you are learning, and and if you make mistakes, what can you do next time to prevent these mistakes? What are you learning in the process? So, having that growth mindset gives you the permission to test out new things, to learn and develop as as you go, and and it's more adventurous in that way. Absolutely, oh, I love that because it can spark the joy as well, right? So it isn't just about working and and thinking about it in such serious terms. It's spark the joy, have some adventure. And, and learn along the way. Yeah, test it out and, you know, learn as you go. It's, 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 it's actually good fun. Like now with what I'm doing, this is totally new territory for me, you know, setting yeah. up my practice, you know, learning about business. This is completely new to me because as, as an academic, I, I write something, I pass it on to the publisher. Everything is taken care of by the university. All I have to do is deliver my stuff. But, you know, to run my own business, I have to, to learn how to create my website. I have to learn how to generate leads, how to, to, to work on my cash flow, you know, like all these things that I, yeah, a lot of new things, but it's, it's a completely new experience and I'm, I'm enjoying the learning again. So amazing. So amazing. I mean, thank you so much for your wisdom and your time. If people want to find you to work with you or check out your books, where can they find you? Well, they can always check out my website. It's called thepamicode.com. So all of my books and services are there. They are more than welcome to to reach out if they want to look at my books or coaching or actually if they want to write their own books as well. I also help um, aspiring authors because I know we all have a story to tell and people are scared um, to write their own story. Either they don't know where to start or they don't feel like they're good enough to write their own book, I can help them um, with that as well in terms of getting started, writing the book and having it published on Amazon and and have a a stellar launch um, during their their launch. So amazing. We'll put the website into into the show notes. Emmy, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. 